All right, welcome to video two of module three, and I'm gonna begin sharing again. So here we go, right back, slideshow. We're gonna talk about law of conservation of energy and some passive energy use, uh, sustainable uses. And uh, you can see there's me and my little baby bear and my riding tractor style solar panel. Uh, I built this so that I can create a little electric fence to keep my chickens safe. Yay. So conservation of energy is considered a weak sister to resource development, but it is now uh, the approach of choice because we're learning that saving pennies on the dollar do add up. And so conservation style energy, finding where there's slips in the energy system that we can harness back that energy and it's getting lost to something we can't utilize is an important piece of sustainable development today. In every isolated closed loop system, the sums of all form of energy will actually remain constant. The problem is in the modern version of energy use in the grid, we lose it to various things. We've all passed under some type of little power line where we've actually heard the buzz of the, of the energy moving through transformers. That buzz is lost to sound energy. Is there a way to harness that? That's a form of sustainable development. So meeting the needs of a growing pop population economics, we've already talked a little bit about how population growth in the United States is growing, but also the amount of energy we choose to consume is also growing. And uh, the population is continuing to grow. And those hitting the older ages of the population are starting to expand. So there's less young than there are older towards retirement, meaning that there is a need to conserve energy or reduce energy so that we can increase population need. Laws of conservation of energy. We've already talked about this quite a bit. And I'd love for you to take that jump down the rabbit hole and think about it a little bit more. Take some everyday mundane thing that you do and just uh, move backwards in the cycle and see how it fits into a system and think about all the losses to the system. So electrical energy in 100 joules, but the light energy is only 70 joules. Where did that energy go? It would suggest that there was an energy that is lost, but it didn't. It just converted into a form we weren't harnessing. And that form is heat energy. And this is a lovely example of going back to when we were talking about, just in the previous video, the, the work equation. Remembering a thermal energy, which we symbolize with Q in our equations, because we're going to be looking more at that and working equations with thermal energy very soon. Another really common example, which plays into module two and Newton's laws of motion, uh, talks about the pendulum. The, the amount of energy put into the system must be equal. So if I take a pendulum and I put it right up to my nose and I let go, as long as I don't move my head and that pendulum doesn't gain energy anywhere, like a huge breeze comes through the room and adds energy to the pendulum, it will swing out from point A to an equal distance at point C and swing back to the distance of point A, but never any greater. Eventually it will slow its swinging because we're going to lose energy to frictional force exuded by gravity on that pendulum, but it will never increase in the energy amount unless something acts upon it, creates a change. Energy can be changed. And there's three ways that energy is changed in the system. One is by work. The second is by additional heat. And the third is by alteration of mass. Obviously, if I made the weight on the pendulum somehow heavier mid swing, it would change the way that the pendulum would swing. If I was to increase the amount of work on it, give it a little flick, it would change the way the pendulum would swing. And if I was to somehow change the thermal mass of the item, 
I change its heat energy, I might be able to alter it such to a rate where it would swing at some formal distance. But the pendulum is not the best example of additional heat. There's obviously better examples and they fall right into our standard energy categories if I talk about the production towards electrical energy. So talking about that sustainable actions, this is energy in is equal to the energy stored versus the energy out. And this is considered a passive solar home design. This is passive solar because it was built in a way that the sunlight was allowed to penetrate the windows. And then once the sunlight entered through that window, there was thermal mass that allowed the floor to be a good absorber of heat energy and the back wall to be a good absorber of heat energy. One of the topics we're gonna to talk about in a lot of detail is actually passive solar design. Uh, how to utilize the environment around you into energy consumption in a passive way. So not requiring a mechanical structure to take advantage of. And it's, it's a simple thing as opening the curtains, right? Can change that. And then at night when it gets cold and there's no longer sunlight to add to the home, closing those curtains. So in this home, when that sun goes down, I have to take action. I have to do an action. I have to close curtains or thermal drapes or something to keep the heat that has now built up in the home itself in, but, and not allow it to seep back out through the window. And that becomes a conversation of functional structure. Functional structure is a big concept in sustainable design. When we talk about doing something like sustainable retrofitting, in a home, one of the things we always want to talk about is whether or not you've done the general energy updates to your home before doing something big. So before you go and put solar panels on top of your roof, you want to make sure that you've actually done the due diligence of making sure that all those little tiny holes and cracks and things have been sealed up so that you have a nice um, thermal state within the home that's kept in there. Otherwise, you're, you're just putting something very sustainable on something that hasn't been updated or retrofitted, prepared for that sustainable setup. So functional structure. This is a place called the McCoskey Center. It's at Slippery Rock University, which is part of the Penn State College system setup and someplace that I know very intimately because I live there during grad school. So... And there is a very young me at college. And here is some of these passive solar designs. This is a living roof system. The benefits of the living roof system allowed us to have a place that water can drain, but it also created a thermal barrier over this structure. This structure was actually a spring house. It is a place where water was coming to the surface so it was naturally about 50, 55 degrees, and we considered it our outdoor ice box. This location was a experiment in living sustainably, and we had to document everything we did. And I mean, absolutely everything. Um, but we also had to eat what we grew and document all that. And so it was an experiment in universal biodome style like that really old movie <laughs> with Polly Shore, uh, except for it wasn't in a dome, it was out in the actual environment. And so you can see we had a solar panel array. It was great because it was on the ground and this was in Western Pennsylvania. So when it would snow, we would go out there and actually move the snow off the solar panels so we could continue to make electricity. We had a ton of wind turbine structures. This is a small one that we would erect and put a turbine up on. And we had a couple other ones around. I built a few of these, so they're very near and dear to my heart. Um, you can see right here is another version of a solar tractor that allowed us to take that out and keep uh, animals safe out in the fields. And this spring house we would use to store our food. And that thermal installation of the living roof system was beautiful very sustainable and green, and it was great at keeping the temperature in the building. Another thing you see here is just a parallel circuited battery array. This was set up to circuit on to different things, including that small solar hot water heater that you saw on the roof of the previous building. Here is an example of the 
solar powered wagon cart. This thing was awesome. It allowed us to pull it around and because it had a battery bank underneath, we could do things like pull the rototiller down and actually run it in a far field. So we could bring electricity to a location where we wouldn't have had electric, electrical power and allow us to garden in slightly remote locations around the facility. It's pretty cool. Here is one of those lovely wind turbine blade structures and uh, we would run workshops to build these small scale ones and erect them. And I will show you more about that when we get to the wind unit. This is a very fun structure. This is an old masonry style of oven, but it's double built so that it can act as a heating system. And the, the fire inside can burn up to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's because it was double structured. And this is a cutout of what it was like. So there was a chamber and then there was an air chamber on either side. And we would basically burn incredibly hot in the morning, some wood. And, uh, and it would heat the chambers next to it. And this would act as a radiator in the facility throughout the day. And if it was really cold and it wasn't quite working, we would open up this little top door here and let that heat out in a little bit more of a blustery. But we would never reopen this. Once that sucker was locked, that was locked. We would burn about three times a day in the dead of winter Pennsylvania style. In the morning when we would wake up, it would be freezing cold. So we would burn right away in the morning. Um, also prepare the building for classes because there was a lot of sustainability classes that would come that we had to help proctor at the time. Um, and then we would burn again somewhere mid afternoon and then once right before we would all go to bed to try to keep the building warm. And this becomes the other part of why I said we had to document everything. This is a composting toilet. We documented when we went to the bathroom um, because we were trying to live in a way where everything we brought in with us had to come out with us. In, and so it had to all be documented. So this is a composting toilet system. It did work on aeration. It is aerobic so that it had venting system on it and uh, that would keep smell down. And I will be honest, it was um, fine. The top part was fine. You'd go to the bathroom, you'd do your business, do, do what you need. And then over here, you can kind of see there's a little bucket right here. That was actually filled with wood chips to keep any type of fluid to our, our use down. We would throw the wood chips in so that it would keep it nice and fibrous as opposed to liquidy. And, uh, and that was pretty much it. You go to the bathroom, do your business, and then throw in a scoop of wood chips. But once a month, you would go down to this part of it, and you'd open up this door here. There was a rake in there. And you'd take the little rake. It was very long. And you would rake your poo away from where it dropped because it would kind of build up in this location. When the compost was completely, completely done, it would fall into a chute down here. And that's this front part right here. This front part where the little grate system is on, on the uh, image, that front part is where the actual completed compost was. And that we would glove up and we would actually bucket out the compost and use it, but we would only use it on the flowers and ornamental style gardens, never on our food. And the reason for that is because humans are not organic. And so if we were to put it on our food growth, even though it was soil now, it was full compost now, um, I couldn't guarantee that there was no particulates of leftover medicines or anything like that for students who were in the building. Um, we couldn't guarantee that it was organic anymore if we were to put it on our food. So we never did that. It was always on our ornamentals, but it was completely usable. Um, so there you go. Energy conservation, the conversions and efficiencies. Energy is conserved and all conservation of energy is important to the useful inputs and outputs of a system. So easy to play with. Finally, I want to leave you with the efficiency concept and measuring out efficiency. And I want the equation, so I'm just flipping fast. Okay, so the equation is efficiency is equal to 100% times useful energy. So it's output, what you're using, 
divided by total energy. So if I ask you to ever find the efficiency of an item, the way you're going to find that efficiency is you're going to take the, the final useful amount, divide it by the energy that was put into the system, and times it by 100. And that would give me its percentage of energy efficiency. If I want to know its inefficiency, I have to subtract that number by 100. So please always read the problems carefully because when you go into the second set and you see the coursework on this, this um, chapter, you will notice that there are questions that move in both directions. So please be careful of that. And on that note, I uh, hope you enjoyed the lecture and good luck with module three.